Greetings BUSN 1360 Software Apps for Business students. So we continue on to Excel Chapter 4 because we want more of Excel, right? So hopefully you've already completed the quiz, learned from that quiz, gotten your points from that quiz, continued into the simulation so that anything that you didn't already know how to do, you could use learning aids and then practice so that the simulation could just guide you specifically through that task in that way you learn the task. And now with the Excel Chapter 4 Grader, this is your opportunity to practice those skills. And of course to get immediate feedback from that grader as you submit the assignments. So let's get started with our work. I've already gone into the grader and downloaded the necessary files. And as you know, I keep them on my um, flash drive for easy reference. But if not, remember you go into my IT lab and you download those files, organize them into a nice folder. So here we are with Excel 4. I'll go ahead and open. They have three files here. They have our uh, work file, which has our begins with our last name, and they have a picture here that shows us what the end oops what the end product looks like. So it looks like this time, you know, we've worked with uh, the graphs and charts and, and all that great visual information. And now we're seeing more of the power of Excel, which is we have this these long data list. And this is a very common use of Excel. And when you have this much data, you know, knowing how to organize it and, and handle it is really a powerful thing. And so we're going to do that in this exercise. And that's what the finished product is going to look like. And let's see, and here's our instructions. So if we look through our instructions, it looks like we have about 13 steps. And so let's go ahead and get started. Of course, we've already finished the first step. We've downloaded those files, saved them someplace where you know that where they are and you're well organized. And it tells us to open that file and to freeze the top row so that the column labels do not scroll off the screen. Okay, let's do that. So here's our Excel worksheet, and if I scroll, you know, you see these labels across the top, inventory ID, warehouse, supplier ID, and if I scroll down, notice how they go off the screen, and that really makes things confusing, especially if you have several columns of numbers, you start to wonder, now, what exactly does this number align with? So what we can do, I'm just clicked here in cell A1, under view, that's where you will see freeze panes. Click on the drop down box and they specifically asked us to freeze top row. So I'm going to click that. Now if you can see that there is a kind of a thin line that goes underneath your labels and that is an indicator to you that that is frozen. And if I scroll down now, if you look at the row numbers, some of the rows are hidden. So for right, for example, right now, rows two through 10 are hidden. And the more I scroll, the more rows are hidden. They're not gone. I can just simply scroll back up and see all my rows. So that was a good first step. We're already, you know, doing well here. Okay, so that was step number two. On to step number three, convert the data to a table and name the table inventory 2021. Right, so let's go back and we're in our table. I'm going, I'm going to go to the home tab there and um, just to, to orientate ourselves. So I'm in cell A1. I want to be in the table somewhere. And if I click on insert, you'll see that I have table. And because we followed the rules that you read about and, and you answered quiz questions about, that we kept our columns together. We didn't skip any blank columns. We didn't skip rows in our table. Our labels across the top are unique. We don't have three columns labeled inventory ID, for example. We only have one. Because we followed those rules, Excel was able to identify that I think this is the range for your table. Now you want to double check that. For example, if it had not noticed that inventory value was part of our table, then we might need to update this range. But 
looks right to me. So I'm going to go ahead and click on OK. And notice, I'm sorry, notice that my table has headers is selected. So I'm going to click on OK. Voila! Now it's a table and we can see that when it's a table it applies some formatting. We could of course apply our own formatting where every other row of the table is got a slight coloring to it. So we will not have to go in there and manually uh, update that coloring you know every time we insert a record. Excel is going to take care of that. Now it also has filtering buttons across the top so that if we could either sort or filter looking for specific numbers and you've gotten a chance to explore those in the simulator. But as long as I'm clicked inside this table I can also go up here and name the table. And notice right now the default is just table 1 because it didn't know what to call it so it's, it just called it table 1. I'm going to click in this table name box and I'm going to type capital I inventory no spaces and 20 21 and when I finish typing I'm going to press enter and now this table has that name. Back to our instructions. Step number four apply table style medium 3 to the table and then there's an extra note depending on the version of office used the table style name may be orange table style medium 3 but it says table style 3 so they're even helping you out if you are using an older version so I'm going to go back to Excel and I do want to go ahead and have my table selected may not be necessary but just to be sure and in my styles format as table it said medium style 3 and they did kind of hint to us that it was orange so you'll see there orange table style medium 3 and I'm going to select that and so that just gives us a little bit of uh, pizzazz to our table. Back to the instructions Step number five, sort the table by warehouse, A to Z, then by unit price, smallest to largest. And then they say create a custom sort order for department so that it appears in this sequence, food and health, collars and leashes, toys, clothes, training, and grooming. And then they have a special note to Mac users to create a custom order list. And so if you're a Mac user, make sure that you're reading that. Let's go back to Excel and when they say that they want us to sort by warehouse then by unit price they want both of those sorts occurring at the same time. These are just the levels of the sort and so what that clues me into is that I'm going to have to do a, a custom sort. So over here where it says sort I'm going to go to custom sort and the first thing they want is warehouse A to Z. The second level is unit price and that's smallest to largest. So I've got that. Then they want one more sort. They said create a custom sort order for department. So I'm going to add that level and I'm going to add department and as I look across you know it doesn't want A to Z instead they want a custom list. So here are some of the common custom lists that they have but we're going to do a new list so that's selected and I'm just simply going to click over here in list entries and the first order is food and health and I have to make sure I type it just exactly the way it appears in the table. I'm going to press enter and on the next line I'm going to type collars and leashes. I'm going to press enter then toys, press enter, clothes, press enter, training, press enter, grooming. Now here's where I commonly make a mistake. Um, I will click OK and wonder where my list went. You have to make sure to click Add and now I'll see it in my custom list then click OK. I know that's an easy mistake but I make that mistake all the time so hopefully you will not. With my three sorts uh, in there I'm going to click on OK and boom! 
we've sorted by warehouse and I can kind of look and see how that's all nice together there's Denver there's Memphis then by unit price so let's just keep looking at Denver unit price it did say from smallest so six to largest so I'll know as long as I'm looking there that I'm in Denver and I'm looking at my unit prices from smallest to largest and then within that let's say I don't see where I have well here we go I've got two prices both thirty three uh, dollars is the unit price and sure enough collars and leashes is coming before training and that's exactly according to our custom list what should happen so let's go back to the instructions step number six remove duplicate records from the table Excel should find and remove one duplicate record now this is an interesting task because they did not tell us what constitutes a duplicate record and by that I mean I'm going to assume that every single uh, value in in the row must be the same for it to be considered duplicate you can decide what constitutes a duplicate. For example, you may have two customers who have the same customer ID. Uh, in that case, you may want to uh, you know, remove it. Two orders, maybe somehow an order got duplicated, and so it's the order ID that uh, is the duplicate, but it doesn't mean that every single uh, what do you, what, I, I would call them field that every single value in the in the record every single field is the same so you get to decide what what makes a duplicated record I'm gonna assume that they mean every single part of that record has to be the same let's go back to Excel and I just need to be clicked anywhere in the table doesn't matter well where because it recognizes Excel recognizes that when we have a table that there is relationship between each value in a record in other words it knows that 19074 is related to Denver is related to this particular supplier ID is related to this department it keeps that relationship intact as we sort for example it doesn't just sort one inventory ID as long as I'm clicked in one cell in the table now you do have to be careful you'll break that relationship between the records if you have a couple cells selected and then you start to sort so you don't want to have multiple cells selected as you're performing operations inside this table you just want to have any one cell selected so when we're working with data that's when we may have duplicated data so I want to look under the data ribbon uh oh okay well thank you for that little tip got it and under data I am going to look to remove duplicate records now you know I love this let me say that sarcastically I love that there are big buttons I love when there are buttons and the name of the button is out to the side of it but sometimes when you get a lot of buttons there's just not room to have a label next to each one and so you might have to hover your mouse over each button so here in the data tools so data ribbon data tools kind of in the very center you'll see this button for remove duplicates and I'm gonna click that now it says to delete duplicate values select one or more values that contain duplicates and what these check boxes are asking you is what constitutes a duplicate and that's what I was just talking about so since every single one of these is checked by default then by default they're saying every single value must be matching in order for this one record to be considered a duplicate of another record okay so if if it was just inventory ID but there could be differences in the rest of the record then I would uncheck those other fields I'm gonna leave it as is and I'm gonna click on OK and this is a nice double check that Excel gives you it says one duplicate value was found and removed and now there's 77 unique values so let's say you had customers come into your store and they have customer loyalty cards right with a customer ID on it 
and you want to know not how many different purchases that customer made today but how many unique customers came into your store and made a purchase today. You could remove the, the duplicates, but you get this really great information because it might say you had five duplicated values, meaning that you know at least one customer purchased more than one thing, right? And then it tells you how many unique customers, so that's nice. But this is exactly what we wanted. I'm going to click on OK. Let's go back to our instructions. So we've removed our duplicated value. It was exactly one record. And in step seven, it says create an unqualified structured reference in column G to determine the value of the inventory on hand and apply a counting number format. To calculate the inventory on hand, multiply the unit price and the amount on hand. So I'm still kind of fixated on unqualified uh, structure reference, right? So one of the questions you had on your quiz dealt with these structured refer references. What is qualified? What is unqualified? What unqualified means is that we, we are not putting every single character or code in our reference to a particular cell to make it just absolutely undeniable. So for example, my pretend student name is Betty Baker. But what if Betty Baker's real name was Betty Ann Smith Baker? Okay. If I wanted to fully qualify her name, I would say, Betty Ann Smith Baker, you come here right now right? It's fully qualified. You know you're in trouble, right, when it's fully qualified. But for it to be unqualified, I may just say something like, um, Betty, right, will you come here? Now, if there's three Bettys in the room, that could be a problem because we wouldn't know which particular Betty we're talking to. And that we would have to say, is it, you know, Betty B? Is it Betty, you know, I don't know, L is it Betty you know whatever so we would have to give further information to start trying to qualify it so that was part of your quiz question it's it's in your book and I encourage you to look at that and I think it clears it up really nicely but let's look at that so we're going to create an unqualified structured reference in column G to determine the value of the inventory on hand um, and they tell us in order to calculate the inventory on hand just multiply the unit price times the amount on hand so back to our Excel worksheet and they want us to do that in column G. So make sure if you've been scrolling, make sure that you're actually on row two. All right, so here I am in G2. And one of the benefits of this is that oftentimes when you start at the very top of your table and you put a formula in, because it's a table, oftentimes Excel is very smart and will populate the table for you. It will fill in the rest of the values in that column for you. So in this, it says we just simply need to multiply the unit price. Well, that sounds like I'm going to have to turn on the calculator, right? I need to be in calculator mode. So all formulas start with an equal sign. And it says the first value I need is unit price. Well, I'm going to click on that, right? And you see in my formula bar how it's starting to fill that formula in. Now, do you see the table name? Remember, we named this table Inventory 2021. I don't see that because there's only one unit price in our table. I don't need to say which Betty am I talking to? Which unit price am I talking to? There's only one. So I don't have to fully qualify it and Excel fills it in. That at symbol indicates we're talking about a field. Uh, there's relationship inside that six dollar unit price to the amount on hand to the department to the supplier and so it, it's a field the name of that field is in square brackets called unit price and it did say we're going to multiply that so I'm going to press that little asterisk key on my keyboard and what was and the uh, multiply that times the amount on hand so I'm going to click that so there's another unqualified value amount on hand I'm not referencing the table name right don't need to once I have that in I'm just gonna press enter on my keyboard and you see how smart Excel was as I click remember what how people in Excel they click 
down in the table, but they're looking up here. Now, isn't this weird? There's no reference to the row that I'm on. It, I don't have to say row 3, make sure you get the unit price from 3, multiply that from the amount on hand from row 3. I don't have to do that. Why not? Because of that relationship. This particular unit price is related to this particular amount on hand, is related to this department, is related to the, this supplier. There is a relationship. Think of relationship, a, a connection, a link, a bond between these values. That's one reason that we would say this is this is really a database. This is a uh, because there is this relationship. So uh, these are fields and these are records instead of rows and columns. They're records with fields. Okay, It's just a different way to name it, a different nomenclature for referring to things in a table. And consequently, our formula says, well, if I'm in this particular cell, then, you know, record, then I must know that I'm talking about this unit price and this amount on hand. Cool. Let's go back to our instructions. As we scroll down here a little bit, well, let's see, which one did we just finish? We just finished step seven, and that was the unqualified structured reference. So now let's look at step eight. Apply a total row to the inventory 2021 table. Set the inventory value to sum and the amount on hand to average. Format, oops, I missed a step in step seven. Did you catch that? I was supposed to format the values in that column to the accounting number format. As soon as they mentioned that in step eight, I realized. So going back to step seven, um, let's, I'm going to select everything in this column. So up here, I'm in cell G2. I can scroll down, for example, and shift and click this last cell. And let me go to home and they wanted the accounting number format. Okay, is it already accounting? It looks like it's already, you know, it displayed accounting in that box, which tells me it was already accounting. So we were actually good there, but it's good that we double checked that. And let's save because I don't think we've saved in a while. Now let's go back to uh, step number eight. They wanted a total row and then they want us to sum one column. They want us to average another column and they want us to format the results with two decimal points. So let's go back to Excel and this is of course our inventory table and any click anywhere in the table and then in table design right here total row. And if you'll notice down here at the bottom once I turned that on I now have an extra row that's this total row. And if I click in that cell, by default it just went ahead and totaled something. And it looks a little different than what we were used to seeing. We're used to seeing sum, right? Well, Excel's very smart and it understands that when you're working with the database that the command is subtotal. You say, well, I'll never learn that. Well, first of all, you didn't have to learn it because Excel was very smart and did that for you. But second of all, you will. You'll be very surprised as you start to observe these things clicking, clicking down in the value and looking at the formula bar, you'll start to kind of say, oh, I see what's going on here. This is inventory value field. I see, and it's subtotaling. So you'll start to, to learn these things over time. This is the first day of the rest of your life learning, right? Uh, you've been learning all your life, so it's not even the first day. But with Excel, you'll just continue to learn uh, like you do in a lot of different computer areas. So underneath, this is inventory value. Uh, they oh, let's see, set the inventory value to sum. And so that's already set to sum. It defaulted at that. We see that with the subtotal. But then under the amount on hand, that's here, they want us to average. So there's the average. Now they do want us to set this field as well as this one to two decimal places. So let's make sure that we do that. This is decrease decimals, so I'm going to decrease that to two decimal places. This one is already at two decimal places, so we should be good there, I think. If you want to just double click, check that. I've right clicked and I can go to format cell and it's the accounting style. 
and it's two decimal places. So we're good there. Save. And let's go back to our instructions. I think we did all the steps. So on to step number nine. It says create a new conditional formatting rule that displays any inventory value in column G for the Food and Health Department with a value of 30,000 or more as red fill color. There will be two qualifying entries if we do this correctly. There will be two qualifying entries. So let's think about this. They want some conditional formatting, okay, and ultimately it's going to result in a red fill color. But what are the conditions? Well, within our inventory table, we're going to look in column G and for the food and health department. So that's one condition. It must be in the food. They didn't express this very well, I don't think. But uh, one condition is that food, the food and health department it must be the department. And then the value, and by that, looks like they mean inventory value, must be 30,000 or more. So I feel like this probably wasn't written as clearly as it, it could have been written, but let's go ahead and, and walk through this and let's see if I get it right when the grader checks me on this. So let's go back to our worksheet. So we just put in our inventory uh, formula and we were really focused on field names at that point. Well, conditional formatting doesn't understand field names quite as much. So at this point, you are gonna have to use the um, cell references, okay? And you got a little a bit of an introduction to that in the simulation. So in fact, I think it was the very last step of the simulation. So make sure that you're going through the quiz as well as the simulation before you work on the grader. It's just, it's to benefit you. It's going to help you out. So I've got cell G2 selected. I'm going to scroll all the way to the bottom. I'm going to hold my shift key down and I'm going to click G78. Now I do not want to pick my total. I'm, they only asked, uh, determine the value of the inventory, they only asked for this, um, you know, for the actual records, not, not the total. So with all that selected, go up to conditional formatting and again from your simulation you may remember that if we're going to use multiple components, we're going to look at, at more than one column to make our decision about how to apply special formatting, then we have to go to New Rule. So New Rule, and we're going to have to use a formula. And that's this very last option here. Use a formula to determine which cells to format. So with this formula, we get to use a new function that we learned as part of the simulation. And that function is AND. So how does this work? Well, we click in the format and all math, anytime we turn on that calculator, all formulas start with an equal sign. So I'm going to type that. Now, if you know a function that will help us do our work, functions are things like sum, average, min, max, and in this case, AND. So I'm going to type AND. And the AND function, any function, is going to begin and end with parentheses. So what I like to do is go ahead and type both my opening and closing parentheses. And then I'm, oops, ah, you know, sometimes it will let me arrow. Since it's not, I'm just going to type the opening parentheses. I'm sorry, it, it kind of took off on me as I tried to arrow. So I'm just going to type that opening parentheses really important point. There is no space between the word AND and that parenthesis. No spaces. Just keep typing. Don't put any spaces in there. Now the first thing our instructions asked us to look at as part of our condition was the department. And when I see the department, I see that it's over here in column D. And when I look at those values, they mentioned food and health. And you can see that in certain places. And the, the important thing about that is that it must be typed exactly the way that it's entered into the table. So they used a little ampersand, food and health. They did not type out the word and, and so that's going to be important. Well, we want this to apply to all the cells, but 
you know, in, in our inventory value. But let's just start by focusing on the very first row because we know Excel is so smart that it can figure out to apply that to each subsequent row. So the first row that has data is cell D2. So D2 and it must equal and it must equal not a number but a text value and anytime we have a text value we're going to put that inside of quotes so I'm going to open quotes and I'm going to type food and health and I'm going to close quotes so let's look at what we have right now all formulas start with an equal sign we've decided to use a function and that function is and and that f function and says multiple conditions. We can string different things in there and say this and that and this and that, right? Well, so what's our first thing that we're going to look at? Well, we're going to look at D2, which is the department, and we want it to equal, since it's a text value, it's inside of quotes, food and health. Since that's my entire first condition, I'm going to type a comma because the comma tells Excel that's the end of the first condition. Now I can think about my second condition. Well, my second condition is that the value in G2 must be greater than or equal to 30,000. It said 30,000 or more. So 30,000 or more means it could be 30,000 or it could be greater than 30,000. Okay, well again, we're looking at G2. Now, how do we do greater than or equal to? Greater than is that symbol, which may be familiar to you. And since we can't just draw a line underneath, and we don't have a symbol on our keyboard that has the greater than with the line underneath it, like we would write in our math class, we just simply type it after. So greater than, and then we just follow it with the equal sign. And the value is 30,000, so that's 30, 1, 2, 3, zeros. Now, we started with the function AND, and it, we opened our parenthesis, so we need to remember to close that parenthesis. Sometimes Excel will remember, but it's good form to go ahead and close it. Whew, that's our, our test. That's how we know we want to format, but we haven't told Excel what that format is. So down here it says we click the Format button, and they told us they wanted, you might be on font color, you know, number, it depends on what you've done recently in Excel. So make sure you go to fill. And down here they told us last row, second column is red. Click OK. And let's click OK again. Hey, how about that? I see one of our values and I could scroll through and there's a second value. Now you may wonder, why not just do this manually. Why not just filter by department, right? I could, because we know we can do this, and look specifically for food and health, and then I could just look at it. Well, first of all, Excel has a lot of columns and a lot of rows, and right now you're only looking through, you know, a hundred so records, but what if you were looking through a thousand, two thousand records? That sure would be a lot to look at. And the second thing is, what if as you get new entries and as values change, maybe the unit price changes, increases, what if the data is changing? This conditional formatting will automatically apply that fill. And so you won't have to go through and remember, you know, oh, we got some new records today. I need to go in and look so I can apply my formatting. You won't have to remember to do that. It will automatically do it and it will be accurate because the computer will be doing that for you. Okay. So I just wanted, this was just a, a shorter way to look at that data. I'm going to unfilter. Now I've applied my conditional formatting successfully. I want to go ahead and save. And let's go back to our instructions. That was step nine. On to step 10. Ensure the warehouse information is not broken up between pages when printed. Add a page break to make sure that each warehouse prints on its own consecutive page. All right. Well, let's go back to our Excel spreadsheet. And it seems like we probably need to look at 
page break preview and I'm going to just click this button down here at the bottom and these blue lines indicate where the page is going to break. When you see this dotted blue line it simply means the paper is, is you know there's no more paper so this last column for example would end up on a, another sheet of paper simply because the paper is not wide enough given our margins and that we have eight and a half by eleven paper you know that type of thing. And the same thing is true as we scroll down this is just a natural page break you can see Excel trying to help us. It's put a little gray page one. That doesn't print. It's just letting us know page one, page two. Okay. So it's just helping us out a little bit there. Okay. Well, they said in step 10 that they want those page breaks to occur after a, the particular department. Or I'm sorry, warehouse, right? Step 10, ensure the warehouse information is not broken up uh, between pages when printed. Add a page break to make sure. Now there's multiple ways to do this. So I see Denver and one thing I could do is I could just go down and grab this. See how when I move my mouse over this blue dotted line? I could just drag this up to where it says Denver, you know, between Denver and Memphis. I could do that. Easy. No problem. Another way is just to right click and choose to insert a page break. When you do that, you want your mouse to be on top of the row that is one row past where you want the page break. If you mess up, if you put the page break in the wrong place, no problem. Drag it into the correct place. So I've got my mouse all the way over the number 28. I'm going to right click and insert page break. I'm going to click away and do you see that that page break is right between Denver and Memphis? If I put my mouse over that page break, that's the blue line, then notice I get a double sided arrow. That simply means I could press and drag that right into the right spot. But now I know that Denver is going to fit on page one and then it will go to page two. But as I look at page two I see that this includes both Memphis and Ponomac and then on into San Diego. So once again I'm going to insert a page break. I'm going to put my mouse right on top of the number 46 for row 46. Right click, insert page break. And again, if you get one in the wrong place, just drag it to where it needs to be. One more time, I'm going to click on row 65 right on top of the row and insert page break. Now I have four pages and I see my page breaks are exactly where I want them to be. And that's a much nicer way to view that report. So I'm going to click on save. Go back to our instructions and we're on to step number 11 and look at this we're almost done set the worksheet to landscape orientation and repeat row one labels on all pages okay I'm gonna go back to Excel now I can continue to work in this page break preview if I like I could switch back to one of my other views like the worksheet or the normal view um, maybe to so that we can see what happens when we make this landscape maybe I'll stay in this particular view for a moment now you may recall I go to page layout and I just like to simply click on this little pop out button for page setup and here I can simply change this to landscape now while I'm here it, um, I could also set my rows to repeat but just for simplicity I'm changing that to landscape and I want to click OK to observe what's happened. So I'm going to click on OK. Do you see that the little dotted blue line went away? And that's because when we change to landscape the paper now is turned sideways so it's it's got width to it and this all fits. My warehouses are fitting very nicely each on its own page. So it's looking good. I'm going to save that. Okay. Now they did tell me that they also want these row headers to repeat and this is what they mean. If I was going to go into print preview right now and you do that by clicking on file and then clicking on print and here I've got a print preview right here. Now see page one how it tells me this is the inventory ID and this is the warehouse ID. If I click to advance to the next page I don't see that anymore. 
Eh, that doesn't look as nice. If I was going to give this particular page to the Ponomac Warehouse Manager, you know, you could separate the report out and give each person their own part. They wouldn't really, like, they'd say, now what is this column again? And what is this column again? And what are these numbers? Right? It would be confusing. So I'm going to use my back button. And I want this, this row, A1, to repeat. Well, how about, you want to switch back to the normal view? I'm going to do that. So, you know, this is what my the normal view looks like. Well, I can simply go right back to page setup. There's there's many ways to do this. Okay, but I'm going to click on page one setup. This is where I have all my tabs. Uh, page, margins, header footer, sheet. And in on this sheet tab, see where it says print titles? All I have to do is click, if I want these ro this first row to repeat, click where it says row and then click in anywhere in, in the first row. And you're used to cells or to ranges of cells being listed as like A1 through A1 or A1 through B7, you know, something like that. Well, it's not interested in the column because it's not repeating columns. It's only repeating the row, row 1. If I had columns that I wanted to repeat, for example, if this first column had labels, I would just simply do the same thing in, in this area, columns to repeat. But all we've been asked to do is repeat the row, so I'm going to click on OK. And let's let's see what the end result looks like by going to file, you know, to print preview. File, print. Here's page one, and we remember that it had those uh, titles on page one. But what about when I go to page two? Now they appear on page two and page three, and it's a much nicer report. And it's just simply repeating whatever is on page one. What you see with people who don't know how to use Excel is they will come down into their data and they will add a row manually and they will for example copy and paste this row manually and you don't ever want to do that. First of all now you've messed up your sorting ability right because when you go to sort and manipulate this data you've added a record into your table by copying and you know this row into it so you don't want to do that um, also it just becomes something you have to maintain if the the labels change for any reason then you have to make sure you change them in every place that you copied them um, it, you just start to create a lot of work for yourself and uh, some people even go to the length of splitting this into one table for Denver, one totally different table for Memphis, another table for each warehouse. Well, that means that you can't do really cool stuff like total everything up just in one foul swoop, right? There are cases where you might need to do that, especially if, if the tables really get excessively long. But in this way, all we're doing is we just tell Excel, hey, just repeat that row at the top of every page. And you saw, it's so easy. Now you know how to do it. You're going to look really sharp. I'm going to go back to the instructions. And let's see. That was step 11. Let's look at step 12. Insert a footer with your name on the left side, the sheet name in the center, and the file name code on the right side. Display the inventory uh, sheet in page break preview. All right, well, let's go back to Excel. And we're going to work on our headers and footers. So I just click my page setup, pop out, go to header and footer. They wanted it in the footer, custom footer. On the left side, they wanted our name. And my pretend student name is Betty Baker. The center, they wanted the sheet, the particular sheet name. Remember, that's not the one with the Excel picture, but this other one. And then in the right, they wanted the name of the Excel file. So we've got that. Click OK. It always looks a little funny because it's squashed up here in this little preview. And I could click OK, but what they want us, well, OK, I can, so I could see it. I could click pr uh, Print Preview right here. You want to do that? See? See how nicely it looks? And now I'm just going to use my back button. So it's got that. I'm going to save that. But they did tell us to display the inventory sheet in page break preview. So we'll go back to that particular view. And that was our last step. We've just gone through this um, quick.
quickly, I'm going to click on Save. Of course, I'm going to close this. And I remember my mistake from the last video, which you may also, which is I submitted the wrong file. So I'm not going to do that this time. I'm sure going to double check that I submit the right file. So I'm in my IT lab. I'm at Excel Grader 4. I'm going to click on that. So here's the grader. Choose File. And I'm going to double check. It got me last time I messed up. I'm going to make sure I navigate to that folder where I keep my Chapter 4 work. There's Chapter 4. Double checking. Click OK. Upload. Successful upload, but now time to submit. Fingers crossed. Hey! First time, look at that one attempt in a perfect 100%. And you know what that means. That means you can make 100% also. I like to say the hard way because as you know, if you make a little mistake along the way with the learning, um, you can still earn that perfect pass grade out of the, the pass-fail structure that's described in the syllabus. But go for the knowledge, folks. Go for the learning. Excel is a wonderful skill. It's very valued in the business world. And hopefully some of the things that we've covered have been examples. Uh, for that. Appreciate you all as usual. Hang in there and um, thanks so much. We'll talk to you later.